You know, it's not all the, just the liver enzymes, it's usually just the protein. Yeah, and it can be the liver, some of them too, but if you see a spike in some of those, that may be signaling that they ha they're having worsening and there needs to be more discussion or more treatment. Uh, review of diagnostic test results is important. And those are all listed, and you can look at those on your jump drive. Of course, an EKG and a chest X-ray, a PA and a lateral should be performed on all patients presenting with symptoms of heart failure. A baseline EKG is vital so that ST and T waves, axis changes, prolongation at PR and QRS and QT intervals can be addressed in response to medications and ongoing myocardial ischemia. So the primary goal in the treatment of hypertension is on attaining a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90, or in individuals with comorbidities such as diabetes mellitus or kidney disease of 130 over 80. And those are to be achieved both with lifestyle interventions and medications. And the use of home blood pressure monitoring is recommended. Like my mom, and she's just lucky because I'm her daughter, she developed hypertension um, out of the blue. You know, she just probably had all those um, inevitable age changes that happened in her system. And she developed hypertension. And so they put her on a diuretic, and it didn't uh, make her blood pressure go into an acceptable range, so then they put her on an ACE inhibitor. Well, immediately, then within three months, she had lost weight under my instructions. And with that, just that little bit of weight, it wasn't even that much. It was like six pounds. It was too much medication, and she, her blood pressure was bottoming out, and she was getting sick. And I don't live in the same town as her. And of course, she doesn't tell me everything. She doesn't want to worry me. But I, I was like, you need to check your blood pressure. That is not normal. Well, then she started checking it, and of course, she was just bottoming out. I'm like, you need to stop taking that and contact your care provider. No, they said to take it, but there is such value in knowing your own body and being a, your own advocate. Or if you have a nurse for a daughter, they be your advocate, but not everybody has a nurse in their family. So when you're with your clients, you have to advocate for them. Know your body. Check your blood pressure daily, weekly, whatever, and know how you respond. So now she's off of her ACE inhibitor and she's just on her water pill but it was a nice, but I have to say I was, if it wasn't for me, nobody had really even suggested they immediately just go right to the drug regime. There was no suggestion of a lower sodium diet or increase, she's very active, but a decrease in her weight. So even though um, we've d had such great strides, there's still lacks in treatments out there. So. Sorry, when I, met, when I teach at the university, I usually have my computer right here and I just go with it as I go, but uh, it's over there and I'm, and this is the largest group I've ever talked to. And you're all nurses and you know what I'm talking about, so you're scary. This is students, <laughs> if I screw up with the students, I'm like, well, they probably don't know. You know, <laughs> so, so, so you're, it's larger and scarier than usual, so. Um, an individual with heart failure, prior MI, high CHD risk, diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease or stroke, a variety of antihypertensive drugs, which are listed there, may be used in the individuals with these conditions. In stage one, and I didn't list how they stage hypertension, but stage one is considered a BP of 140 over to 159 over 89 to 99. And the first line of treatment is a diuretic, a thiazide diuretic. And while those with stage two, which is considered greater than 160 or diastolic greater than 100, a drug combination is usually required. And dosage and additional drugs are usually added, like with my mother, until the blood pressure is, goal is reached. And lower additional doses may be required to avoid symptoms and orthostatic hypotension.
Lifestyle modifications are an important contribution to blood pressure reduction and include, and I guess this is a pet peeve of mine since they didn't even say anything to my mom, a weight reduction to a BMI of less than 25, adoption of the DASH eating plan, uh, increase in physical activity to at least 30 minutes a day, most days of the week, and limiting alcohol consumption to less than two drinks per day. And like my mom was an, a proof of the pudding, a 48 decrease in body weight is associated with the three millimeter uh, reduction in systolic BP and diastolic BP. However, weight reduction in the very old has been associated with an increased risk of death and hip fractures. That's an area that's very under-researched and needs more data to make any recommendations about weight loss in the older than 80 group, I believe. So what are the initial goals of treating hypertension and heart failure is to alleviate symptoms and improve oxygenation improve circulation, correct the underlying causes of heart failure. Long-term goals, improve exercise tolerance, functional capacity, reduce hospital readmission rates, and decrease mortality. I was just at my nephew's graduation, and the valedictorian, it was a high school, he had a quote, and it said, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And I think it's from an action film, but anyway, I like the context of it, not in the context that he used, but it's kind of reminds me of evidence-based practice because the more we can prove, it's moved us so far in our treatments. And that's why um, there is, I did have a bib for all this with all the studies that all this information came from and the level of the studies or the information that it came from, level one, two, three, four. Five, so that when you're saying things and you're in requesting things or encouraging changes in practice, you can back it up with your research. So it's what we can prove. Um, the management of heart failure follows standard American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association Task Force recommendation, and it includes intensive treatment of coexistent hypertension, coronary heart disease, and renal disease. And importantly, optimal treatment of hypertension is crucial to the, both the prevention and treatment of heart failure. They have identified uh, prognostic, prognostic indicators of a four-year mortality for older adults diagnosed with heart failure. Uh, patients with renal dysfunction, pulmonary disease, a BMI of less than 25, diabetes, hypertension, and cancer, as the, well as those who continue to smoke, have a greater risk of mortality when coupled with a decrease in functional status. And that decrease in um, any activity of daily living, <coughs> difficulty in bathing, managing their finances, walking several blocks, so if they're coupled with one or more of the above, are at greater risk for mortality. So a chart review and a history during hospitalization should then include not only the standard accepted cardiac risk factors, which were listed a little earlier, but also the key indicators as listed above. Detecting these additional prognostic indicators can aid in developing interventions that can improve quality of life and survival. Now, heart failure is listed according to stages. So it's uh, the American College of Cardiology and Heart Association Tax Force guidelines classifies heart failure in four stages. And stage A includes individuals with hypertension, atherosclerotic disease, diabetes, obesity, or metabolic syndromes, or those using cardiotoxic substances, or those with a family history of cardiomyopathy. And how are they treated? Their, their, their hypertension and lipid disorders are treated, and smoking cessation and regular exercise are encouraged. Stage B 
And I didn't put this down because I don't know if you, if you work in a cardiac unit, you know it. If not, you can look at it or it's in the information that I gave you. Includes individuals with previous MIs, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, low ejection fraction, and symptomatic valvular disease. How are they managed? Same interventions as employed for stage A, ACE inhibitors, ABR, ARBs, and beta blockers. Stage C individuals includes individuals with known heart disease and symptoms, shortness of breath and fatigue, and reduced exercise tolerance. These people are treated with dietary sodium restriction. And I, I'm a little more like, I think that we should employ dietary sodium restrictions earlier, but I guess as a society, that's just really hard for us to accept. The diuretics prescribed to treat fluid retention, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, ARBs, digitalis, hydro, hydrolozine, hydrolozine, I was going to say hydrochlorothiazide, but hydrolozine, sorry. Patients with arrhythmias may need a, require a pacemaker or implantable defibrillator. In stage D, includes individuals with refractory heart failure, which requires the use of specialized interventions, and include patients with marked symptoms at rest, despite maximal medical treatment. And uh, the care for those patients are as listed. Uh, a student and I were in on a medical code just about a month ago, and this patient is what I would consider in stage B heart failure. And he was uh, a medical code, for those who don't know it, like upsurps a full-on code. It's like they come in and try to medically treat you before you actually are coded. And so he was getting high doses of dobutamine and dopamine, and they gave him a little bit of fluids, but he couldn't really handle it because he was in end-stage heart failure. But he had a living will, but it was on a ranch, and I live in Missoula. It was on a ranch in Bailing, Bailing's area with his daughter, and she was on a trip. It was just this whole convolution, and he, uh, it was so sad because she said, the care provider who was also running the medical code said, you know, I, I don't know what else we can do. Your heart is really sick. And I really liked her frank talk with him, but I don't know how often this frank talk had occurred prior to this because he, then they left the room and the student and I were there. And he said, you know, I knew I was sick, but I had no idea I was this sick. I don't, I don't want to die. And it just was really sad to me. It's like, I really don't think he knew his fate. So I guess that's just another um, uh, soapbox for educating our patient and including them all along the way so that when you get to a stage D patient, they know what the outcome is from that point and what can be done. And that just broke my student's heart. And she brought it to an ethical uh, discussion in one of her other classes. And it's, uh, it's nice because it starts the discussion in those students. And hopefully, they can go bring the energy forward. And we can all be more cognizant of being educators to our patients. So like I said, the next one is open and honest discussion, screening for depression, which is very uh, common in commonly seen in the elderly, as well as um, in individuals with cardiovascular disease. And ensure that patients participate in the decision making. And a lot of patients are of that thought that you're the medical provider, we're the patient, and they kind of want to take a passive role. So we have to encourage them to um, be participants. And I listed the drugs that uh, are used in the management of older adults with hypertension and heart failure. And you can look at the benefits and, of course, the potential side effects. And then, of course, anytime they're on any medication, it requires careful monitoring. The one I do want to stop on is the diuretics, because I do think that's 